Okay. Well, let's see. I've heard stories about this. Yes, I'm John Cadona. I'm here um, replacing, for the purposes of this talk, uh, Olivier Guillon. And he's uh, sad to not be here, but he's in Japan with another, another thing that was accidentally co-scheduled. Um, so we will, yeah, it works. All right, so um, our project is about uh, coronography of looking for the next generation, the next tier of information from exoplanets. Um, there's a lot of exoplanets that are, that are known um, now, uh, and there is a significant fraction of them that are potentially habitable. Um, so in the coming decade and decades, the big challenge is going to be to actually extract spectral information from those exoplanets and uh, look for various different markers for, for life, habitability, um, various different uh, aspects like that. So that's the challenge, is to not just detect them, but to, to uh, see them with significant suppression of the starlight. <laughs> OK. So uh, we're looking at um, the fundamental challenges for this are uh, high contrast imaging um, with the large telescopes. The large telescopes that we're talking about in the future are going to be significantly larger than the current ones. And as a result, they almost certainly will be segmented primary mirrors. And as a result, you have to deal with building a coronagraph on a segmented telescope, which uh, until Recently, really, that was considered to be kind of the death knell of being able to get high contrast is, is uh, having segments. Um, so because of all kinds of different reasons, the fact that you, uh, you have control of multiple segments, uh, the relative positions of the different segments with each other, um, the shapes of the individual segments, and also when you build a coronagraph and you block the light in the focal plane, you end up with residual light which shows up all over the, the pupil plane in the downstream Leo plane. So you have to deal with all of that, and that was considered to be quite difficult. Um, so that's one of the next challenges. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're uh, making significant progress on that though. Um, we have a small team at the University of Arizona. Um, is, there's uh, Olivier and myself, um, who are the, the senior scientists on this. And we have uh, two graduate students currently and one undergraduate student um, who is working with us to, to build this uh, test lab facility. Uh, let's see. OK. No idea why that happened. Did I push the wrong button? All right, um, one more. That's not supposed to be blank. Oh, typical. Interesting. OK, so uh, the technologies that we're working with include basically two major areas. There's uh, coronagraph design and wavefront control and segment co-phasing issues. Uh, the coronagraph design um, includes uh, parts that Olivier has been working on and uh, there is a part which uh, has been going on, but primarily in ground-based coronagraphs that um, I developed uh, through a NASA APRA grant in, in the last decade. Um, the, the PSCMC uh, idea is uh, a high contrast, very capable architecture for coronagraphs. Um, and the other piece that I want to mention at least a little bit about here is the pupil phase apodization chronograph idea, which just uses only a phase pattern in a pupil plane, no focal plane mask, no Leo stop. 
as a result, it's much easier and simpler to work, but it's not in the same category in terms of performance. All right, also we've been working on wavefront control and segment co-phasing, um, a technique which, uh, which I've developed over the last uh, couple years is called differential optical transfer function, and I'll talk about that. Um, which is a, a, a very simple technique that um, can be used with very with basically no hardware impact on on a system to do uh, segment co-phasing or aberrations uh, measure aberrations in in the pupil plane um, and then the higher order techniques um, the low order wavefront sensing and uh, a a very high quality technique which is new called linear dark field control. All right, these, uh, these are going to uh, help us dramatically to be able to achieve the goals that, that are in the NASA milestones coming in, in coming decades, but also in nearer term things like JWST and WFIRST. It'll take a little getting used to, All right, let's see. All right, start with PSCMC. This is, a, this is sort of the state-of-the-art coronagraph design. PIA is a, a pupil remapping technique um, that Olivier developed and uh, remaps the, the ray density coming into a pupil into some apodized form. So instead of putting essentially, as a, someone said yesterday, sunglasses on a telescope, um, which, of course, throws away light. As a matter of fact, a shocking amount of light if you actually go through uh, trying to set up what would be necessary in order to suppress the halo significantly, you end up with just you know, less than 10% of the light making it through, which is a, a crying shame to build a giant telescope and then only end up with this tiny fraction of the light coming through. Uh, as a result, uh, this, tech, well, this technique is, is a, a very clever way of actually keeping it all by just reshuffling all of the rays around in, in the pupil plane so that it's apodized, but you actually just changed where the rays go. Um, so it still has that effect, but, but it, it, it actually distorts the image plane if you do this. And so you end up with the, the need in order to be able to put your planet light off axis out of being completely turned into a giant coma um, back into the form by, by inverting and, and uh, having a post-processing PIA that's after the fact. So that's, I don't know if I actually have the ability to do a laser. Does this work or am I going to do something horrible? I don't know. Well, anyway, so the first block uh, on the diagram there is, uh, is a for forward PIA. Um, that just remaps the pupil so that it goes from unapodized to apodized, and then you go through possibly adding a, another apodizing layer, which is a, a post-processing pair of sunglasses, essentially, if, if needed. Then you image it to a focal plane where you have a mask. Um, in addition to having a normal coronagraphic kind of mask or a phase-shifting mask in, in this particular idea, um, you can add another uh, phase-changing mask in that plane also, which I'll, I'll just mention briefly what that's for. Then you, uh, you block the star there. You then re-image it back into what would be a pupil plane. Um, it goes through the inverse, the inverse PF. Well, you go through a Leo stop there, um, which, which blocks the light, which... Um, goes where the pupil normally wasn't, plus any trimmed off pieces that you need. And then you go through the inverse PIA, which is just the same input optics that did the aptization, but flipped around backwards to undo it. And then now you have an un-remapped pupil plane, which you then re-image to a camera. So the idea is that you can go through this sequence of events here, um, and as with a normal coronagraph, uh, you block the light in the focal plane, and you end up with the light then being scattered around or diffracted into the, into the various parts of the, the downstream re-imaged pupil plane, which, um, which normally you would, you would say, because of the fact that the planet, when, it, when you look at that, you want to still cut off all of the light that's, that's, around, the, um, that's around where the initial pupil was, um, but you'd trim it on the inside. 
the idea for this is that you actually add an extra phase modulation, which re-adds all of the parts of the halo from the focal plane in such a way that they actually don't have any power anywhere inside the nominal Leo stop. So you don't need to actually undersize the Leo stop, which is a typical thing. Also, you can do it if there's cracks between the segment, it's possible for you to stick the light into those places. Anyway, I guess I'd better move on. All right, um, an amusing thing about this is because of the fact that you add this phase mask in the focal plane, in addition to the regular focal plane mask, you, you add bits of curvature to the different parts of the wavefront, which move where the Leo stop actually focuses you in relative to the pupil plane. It's sort of like adding a bit of uh, phase diversity, of, of focus diversity. So you end up, instead of having your Leo stop ideally located in a single plane, you end up with it located in a number of different places depending. So if you had phase curvature near, say, a diffraction spike, you would actually see that the, the pieces for your Leo stop are most in focus at a slightly different place than the other ones. So this, uh, one, one of the aspects of this is that you find that if you're really trying to, to minimally impact other parts of light which don't focus at the same exact place, you want to break up your Leo stop into several different planes and have, have a number of them at the place where they are most in focus, which is a bit of an art at the moment, but it's, uh, it's interesting. All right, let's see. Okay, phase appetization is our, our other design approach for doing things like this, um, is, uh, is just applying a phase pattern in the pupil plane, like I said, no focal plane mask, no Leo stop, it's just one chance to affect the light as it comes through. Because you're using phase, you actually end up creating a, a, a diff diffracted wavefront piece that's got a halo that has the opposite kind of symmetry of the diffraction pattern of transmission things like uh, structures of your pupil mask. So one is uh, Hermitian and the other one's anti-Hermitian, which is just to like symmetric and anti-symmetric, but in complex. Um, so, uh, so that means that normally, you at least naively might think that that means that you can only suppress on one side of the star. But it actually turns out, and I can show examples to anyone who wants to contact me and find out more, um, that you can actually do significantly more than that. In fact, you can actually suppress the light all the way around the star, but uh, the, the thing that you end up with is is um, going to be uh, the, 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 you don't end up with as much power in the PSF core as you would like. Um, but anyway, it, it allows you to get down to five or six decades of raw contrast, which may be enough for certain applications. Um, the nice thing about doing something only in the pupil plane is that you actually don't need to aim it. You don't need to line up with a focal plane mask. Your guiding requirements are completely relaxed in comparison. You just take pictures and do shift and add. Uh, and, and the other thing is that because of the fact that you don't have a Leo stop in a downstream re-imaging plane, you can build something that's a lot more compact, um, which, is, which is a very nice thing. Let's see here. I keep aiming there. Uh, it can be implemented as we have been so far. Well, we've been building these for telescopes, AO telescopes on the ground using diamond termed optics, um, but it can be just as easily implemented using a deformable mirror, which means that you can change how you optimize the solution that you're making use of uh, with a computer program instead, or you can rotate where that dark hole is as the sky rotates or whatever you need. Uh, it's, a, it's a very flexible solution. Um, so so uh, that's the direction that we want to go in in the future with this. Ah. Warned me about panicking. All right. Okay, uh, it, it's possible to use this with any different pupil design. Um, that's a, a solution on the top is, is a, a probably familiar looking pupil, um, the, but hypothetical. and. The one on the bottom is the Giant Magellan Telescope, and you can see that with that very strange looking phase pattern on there, it actually suppresses, significantly suppresses the halo around there. So, so it will be a very good solution for doing coronography, uh, probably also in, in 
some combination with uh, the PM, PSCMC idea. But even by itself, this will be a very powerful technique. All right, so wavefront control. Um, these, are, these are the sort of numbers that you see when you're trying to uh, do co-phasing. Uh, these, are, these are the requirements that you'll be, be looking for. And, and we're talking a few picometers uh, for an eight meter telescope um, over a five minute time frame. Uh, things that are going to be significant issues for this are going to be not just being able to uh, control tip tilt errors, um, but also intersegment uh, co phasing, the small drift, small vibrations, which are going to cause nanometer scale fluctuations or even smaller, but are going to have a significant impact on the ability to suppress the halo. Uh, so, uh, over those kind of time frames, if you, if you uh, talk about things like reaction wheels and things of that sort causing vibrational coupling to segments and flutter, you're going to have to deal with both measuring those things and, and controlling them. All right, so we have, as we said, as I said earlier, we have three different approaches for doing wavefront sensing. Um, this is the technique that I was talking about, differential OTF. Uh, it, is, it is new and it is surprisingly simple. Um, the, the idea, and, and I, I'm not kidding here when I have the finger, I'll explain. So what you do is you actually take a picture of a star using your optical system. Once you've got the picture, you take a Fourier transform it and that gives you your estimate of the optical transfer functions. Complex piece which, which is uh, actually the pup pupil's complex field measured at two different points in the pupil averaged over the pupil plane. So, so you do that and that gives you one point in, in the optical transfer function. Um, and so you get a complex map. My blue picture there uh, is, a, is, the way of, is a way of plotting complex numbers. That's uh, the brightness is the amplitude and the color represents the phase. So blue would be real, red is 180 degrees and green and yellow are supposed to be uh, 90 degrees off in either direction, right? So you do that with one, and then you take another picture of a star, but instead you make some small change in the pupil that's near the edge, and I'll explain why that's important, um, which literally can be sticking your finger into the edge of the pupil, literally. Uh, and and you, the amazing thing is you don't have to calibrate your finger either. Uh, you just, just make it some modification like that. You can do that or you can add a small phase variation at the edge. And you do it again. You take a picture of the star. You Fourier transform it. You get another estimate of the optical transfer function. And then you subtract the two estimates. And you get this strange looking double pattern, which is the complex pupil field and another image of it reflected around the point that you made your modification complex conjugated. And, and that, is, uh, that is directly interpretable as the pupil field. Okay, so this is a, just a, a little bit of sanity here, is that, that what happens when you do this, the optical transfer function plotted in sort of this color is phase way and the amplitude is, is the height of this su surface that I've plotted there. That's the Fourier transform of all the photons that went into your, your image of the star. Um, and it's big, it's got a lot of amplitude that is showing up there. And then you take the other one and you subtract it and the difference between those two PSS can be very small, so you get a correspondingly small measurement between them. So what, what you end up with is this uh, little difference between the two in complex, which has the structure that I was talking about. But because it's a differential measurement, it's not as easy to get high signal quality because you're effectively throwing away most of your signal when you take the difference between two images. Um, but it directly gives you what you want and it's not really outrageous. Uh, I just published a paper in the JADIS journal talking about how this could be applied to segment phasing with the James Webb Space Telescope and that, um, and in there you can see that it actually would only take a few minutes to make a measurement like this uh, with very high accuracy. Uh, for, for measuring the relative positions of the segments. 
Okay, here's a, here's a few quick examples. Um, a, a pattern put onto a deformable mirror uh, of the letter A and then taking pictures of two star images. Um, take the Fourier transforms of those incredibly deformed star images, s s uh, subtract them from each other, and you get a phase and amplitude map which shows the, very clearly shows the pattern that was on the deformable mirror. The top right-hand side picture here uh, is a Boston Micro Machines deformable mirror with a test pattern that was applied to it and using one single actuator moving it just about 100 nanometers and like I said you don't actually need to know precisely what you did with that one actuator that you moved just you need to move it and when you do that it gives you this this information out which is uh, accurate to, to uh, certainly with a very small exposure time um, it was easily achieved to, to get 10, like 10 nanometer accuracy in the measurements. Um, with an Iris AO segmented mirror, um, this is uh, it's more like if you use the James Webb Space Telescope to do this, you get, uh, you get a picture which is, the, which is on the right hand side there. So these, uh, these capabilities are very easily achieved this way. Right, so. Um, on the JWST, uh, we've studied what would happen if you used the, uh, the filter wheel to, on, on near cam to actually uh, introduce the pupil modification, and it worked better than the required amount of uh, wavefront error. In addition, using a tilted segment, thing will drive you nuts. There was supposed to be a different slide there. Well, that's all right. You get the idea. There, there's also, you can also take a single segment and, and move it. Can you try forwarding that, please? I have no idea why it happened. All right, you just go back. I'll head on. Low order wavefront sensing, this technique um, has, is essentially looking at light which is reflected from different parts of the coronagraph. So you can look at light which is reflected from the focal plane mask, um, which normally you would just absorb and throw away. Uh, but you can reflect it off and, and use it to uh, make a sensor. Um, and since it contains most of the light from the star, it's a high signal. Um, or you can look at the parts of the Leo stop, which also would block the light from the star, which also has a lot of light to work with. And those pieces of information um, are sensitive to the low order aberrations. They're also sensitive to other aberrations also, but, but they're, they're used in this particular case to do things that are like low order. So this is an example that was done uh, at JPL that gives a, an idea of the kind of performances you can get out of this just looking at tip tilt control. And it was a, a thousandth of a lambda over D control, um, which is uh, quite significant. But the challenge isn't, so, isn't only tip-tilt control for the guiding of the entire telescope. It's going to be individual segments and managing to maintain their phases and, and their individual positions. And so, so uh, that's what we're studying in, in our laboratory, is actually setting things up to, to study the light that reflects in these different ways and then analyze it to get the information about the individual segments. All right, this is linear dark field control. Um, the idea of this is that you look, when you have a coronagraph and you've, you've tuned it up so that you have a very dark region that you've identified by, by designing things and running an algorithm, um, and then you want to look at your science target, you want to be able to control the, the positions that you have for that uh, alignment of the, the segments and the, the active control elements of your system so that you maintain that dark hole. Uh, this technique says that if you, if you have light which um, comes from deviations, aberrations caused by segments which are drifted out of the position of where they were, they'll scatter light not only into the region where your science images are being taken, which if you wanted to try and measure that directly, you'd have to do something like, 
like send in a probe field into that region and analyze it by doing things which anytime you add light into that area, you're harming your science data. So instead, you say there's all of this light that surrounds the dark region anyway that you've, you've got scattered away. If you use that essentially as your interferometric reference beam, when you add in the small extra piece from the aberration, instead of it being the leading term being itself time, times itself from, the, from computing the intensity so it becomes nonlinear as a part of that, uh, when you add it to the, the halo which is bright outside of the dark field, that allows you to say that the leading order term is linear because of when you expand it and you just keep the first term, it, it, the, the term is linear. So it's possible to calibrate this as well while you're making these other measurements to, to adjust it so that it's a dark zone to begin with. You also end up with this other information which allows you to calibrate what th the meaning is essentially of variations in all of these different speckles which are outside of the band and also outside of it in wavelength space where the, where the bandwidth has, has gone to a point where, where it's no longer as suppressed. And putting those pieces of information together allows you to make a linear control. All right. Yes, so, so even though you're not making the measurement anymore, you're not doing the calibration anymore, when you move to your science target, what you'll do is you'll take pictures which you are mostly interested scientifically in the dark region, but you take a picture which includes the bright halo that's filled with speckles on the outside, and you compare that to the light that was, was measured on the reference star, and and as a result, you can make a, a picture which is the difference between the halo for, uh, for, for the drifted off piece versus the reference uh, PSF pattern. Where the halo is dark, the, pro, um, the residuals are going to be nonlinear because of the magnitude squared part of it. Um, but outside, the leading term is linear. So if you look at what happens to the difference, you have to scale it if the magnitudes are not the same, and you look at what, what that implies is that you'll end up with speckles everywhere, which will be caused by the perturbations, but the part that's outside where this, the halo initially was left bright, um, that part of it has, has a, a uh, linear behavior, and you can use that as part of a control, and you just ignore the part that's on the inside where it's nonlinear. Um, there, this is a detailed comparison between, between uh, the state of the art, which is electric field com, uh, conjugation technique, which is essentially doing interferometry. You throw in reference light, you shift the phases of it, and you make a, an actual literal interferometric measurement of the field by doing that. Uh, and then you have a nonlinear iterative process to, to deal with it as opposed to the linear dark field control, which because it's linear sort of by this, this trick of having bright stuff that you've added to all of the, the aberrated light or scattered light, um, then the control is, is significantly easier because of the fact that you only have to take one other picture and then it's the diversity of all of the different speckles that give you things. Okay, it's, uh, this, is, this is a very tiny picture of, of uh, the accuracy that you should be able to get out, and um, it's compared here. I, mean, I guess this is all going to be online, and I'm, I want to make sure I don't run out of time. I'm out of time. Uh, all right, so, so anyway, yes, the, the performance estimates suggest that this actually will be a very powerful technique. We have a test bed at the University of Arizona that's designed to test all of these different things. It's designed to have a PIA system included. Um, it's got two deformable mirrors, uh, a segmented deformable mirror and a uh, continuous sheet deformable mirror, um, a uh, broadband laser, a super continuum laser, and the, the combination of those things will allow you to test very many different uh, coronagraph architectures. Uh, the PIAs aren't necessary, so you can just replace those parts with flats and then uh, test a regular Leo coronagraph or something else. Uh, this is uh, dissemination of results. Um, and 
summary of the key points, which is, uh, yeah, the, the, the amazing thing is that, that um, we can now quite clearly state that, that segmented architectures are not the kiss of death for coronagraphs, which is an important point. Um, the, the architecture of PSCMC may not be the only approach, um, but it's, it's certainly a very promising one. Um, there's, uh, we have, we have um, requirements for co-phasing errors, which we developed. Um, vibration control is the leading order problem for, for controlling these things. So being able to make measurements of segment fluctuation caused by various different things like motors and uh, cryogenic subsystems are going to be the leading order problem. So that'll have to be dealt with. Um, we have a, a new approach for co-phasing using focal plane images uh, with DOTF, um, which, which is uh, very nice, um, sort, of, sort of like the, the phase appetization idea. If you don't have the complex parts that, require, that are required, if you want to do the, the things like uh, regular wavefront retrieval techniques, you can actually use DOTF with whatever you've got, this, the deformable mirror, you could actually set things up so you just have basically some kind of little pin that sticks into the side of the pupil mask and it will allow you to make a, a very high quality measurement of the wavefront. So it's good for small scale um, measurements and it's good for, uh, for simpler systems. Um, and let's see, then, uh, yeah, the, the other techniques are the, the linear dark field control is new and, and it's, uh, it's very promising. And then when we said the summary of, uh, let's see. No. Can you just go ahead, please? Oh. I uh, don't understand why there isn't another slide. Well, anyway, it basically says we're going to disseminate, disseminate the results um, by writing papers on the various different things. We've got papers which, which have uh, already been coming out on, on a variety of these different topics. Uh, we're, we're expecting to do things on linear dark field control later this year and uh, experimental papers on on DOTF uh, for segmented telescopes, including noise, um, deconvolution, being able to use it with broadband light, et cetera. All right. Any questions? talking about uh, when, when, like the linear dark field control or, or which part, because I never mentioned fibers. The uh, last sentence of your talk, uh, tip the hat to my question, uh, broadband? Yes. Oh, broadband, yes. DOTF with broadband, it's a, it's a very interesting point because normally if you were talking about doing something that's an interferometric measurement and you're talking about making measurements of the, the phase, you would be completely killed by the fact that you're comparing like different wavelengths. Um, but the reason that this works is, is actually a subtle point of doing this, which is that when you make this measurement, literally <coughs> speaking, you aren't measuring the phase of the wave measuring the phase of the wave correlated with the, the wave complex conjugate of the point where you made the, the pupil modification. So you're actually measuring something which has to do with the mutual coherence function. And that phase relationship is the, 
is the spatial phase relationship between those two points. So granted, as you change over a large wavelength range, there's going to be a geometric scaling uh, between those points if, if that's the origin of the, of the picture. But they're all in phase relative to each other because the, because the mutual coherence function um, at each wavelength is what adds together over the different wavelengths. If, if that's not clear, I can talk to you more about it later. And, and that's one of the subjects of one of the papers that we're planning on doing this year. I think that was clear. So then what, um, so obviously that leads to a segmenting strategy or a, uh, an array strategy. What, what would be a practical number of wavelengths for a single cell? So you mean by a single cell, a single segment? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so it depends on one of, one of our research projects is, well, let me just back up briefly. I said that you Fourier transform, you Fourier transform each one of the PSF images, and that's how you get the OTFs, which you then subtract. But as you know, the PSFs at different wavelengths have scale factors, so red PSFs, and, and yellow and green are different sizes. When you Fourier transform that, the Fourier transforms have an inverse scaling relationship. So when you do this business that I'm talking about, those parts all will add if you just did all of your wavelengths together, and you'll end up with a radial, a scaling of this phase pattern radially, which, uh, which makes it blurrier the further you go away from the center of the pupil away from the position where you made your measurement. So you could conceivably make another measurement and then have all of those points be close to some me measurement point. But there's also the hope, um, which I have an algorithm which needs to be ver validated in the lab. But even though it's a, a convolution radially where the radial blurring is proportional to the distance away, which you would think isn't something you could just deconvolve, um, it turns out that by combining that with a geometric transformation uh, into another space where it is actually something that you can de deconvolve, uh, you should be able to do this and combine all of those parts together. And my hope is that you will actually get very high resolution. But if you don't do anything at all, it's, it's essentially the amount of blurring radially that you get for how a bandwidth is going to be proportional to um, delta lambda over lambda. So at at one diameter of a pupil away, so say for example it's five segments, like on the JWST, then it would be a 20% bandwidth would blur you across completely in that direction. Um, for the JWST, there are filter choices in the cameras which are significantly narrower than that, so it's not really an issue because you don't have to do that. But certainly, if you if you found yourself in the situation where it's the only choice, or if you if you needed it for some other reason, like for getting more photons in, um, deconvolution is actually a very it's it's very promising, but it hasn't been proven yet, so I can't say. But but it looks good in the computer.